Breathing. I think we can all agree that this is a very important activity to participate in, especially if you want to remain living. But during exercise, pulmonary ventilation or breathing can increase up to 20 fold. That is incredible. So in today's video, we're going to take a look at real human lungs to help us figure out how and if these amazing organs can make long term adaptations or changes to exercise. Can we increase lung capacity? Can we get more efficient with our breathing? Lots of fun questions to answer. And I think some of those answers might not be what you expect. So let's take a deep breath and jump right into this anatomical awesomeness. So for us to best understand any potential changes with the lungs or with breathing, let's do a quick little review on how breathing is supposed to work. So the main breathing muscle, the diaphragm, will contract. And as this muscle contracts, it will pull downward. And this will actually increase the volume or the space within this thoracic cavity that you can see both lungs occupying. Now, what are we going to do with this extra space? Well, if we have this increased space, that will actually decrease the pressure in here. So now the pressure outside of the body, the atmospheric pressure, is greater. And that air, which contains the oxygen, is going to want to rush in. And it will rush in through either the nasal cavity, if we're breathing through the nose, or the oral cavity for breathing through the mouth, and then move down through the trachea, which people will often nickname the windpipe. But I also want to show you a longer trachea attached to the lungs. You can see the full length of the trachea here. But you'll notice that the trachea is going to start to branch into the lung tissue. And this will branch multiple, multiple times, and the tubes will get smaller and smaller as they branch, till eventually we'll get to the end of the tubing to these tiny little air sacs called alveoli. Now these alveoli are going to be surrounded by tiny little blood vessels called capillaries, specifically pulmonary capillaries. Now here is where we're going to see some exchange, or in other words, we'll see oxygen and carbon dioxide trading places. That oxygen that we just breathed in will move from the alveoli into those pulmonary capillaries, so now it's in the bloodstream, and that carbon dioxide that's in the pulmonary capillaries will leave the bloodstream and move into the alveoli and then we'll breathe it out. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, pulmonary ventilation, the amount of air we can move in and out of the lungs, can increase up to 20 fold during maximal exercise. And we essentially accomplish this increase by increasing the respiratory rate, the number of breaths per minute, and the volume or amount of air we bring in during each breath. And the need for this demand or this major increase in pulmonary ventilation, which I'm just going to mostly refer to breathing now, is due to these wonderful structures that we call skeletal muscles. As a skeletal muscle contracts and exercises, its need for oxygen consumption dramatically increases, as well as how much carbon dioxide it's producing. But let me give you some interesting numbers when it comes to oxygen consumption. The oxygen consumption of a young, healthy male at rest is about 250 milliliters per minute. But let's say we're going to take that person and have them exercise at maximum capacity, but they're not very fit, they're not very well trained, don't exercise consistently. Even then, we'd see that it would go from 250 milliliters at rest all the way up to around 3,600 milliliters per minute. Now, if we had somebody who was a little bit more fit, exercised consistently, was somewhat athletic, that could go as high as 4,000 milliliters per minute. A marathon runner, 5,100 milliliters per minute. So granted, it makes sense that oxygen consumption is going to go up with exercise regardless of your training status or how fit you are. But it was kind of crazy to even see in somebody who's not trained, 250 to 3600 is quite the jump. But even from that 3600 to 5100 to that marathon runner, something's happening where there's an adaptation occurring with training. Is that coming from the lungs? Well, let's find out. But before we get into how and if we can build up our lungs, I think it might be a good idea for us to think about building up our first line of defense with our internet browsing. And that's why I want to take a second to say thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Guardio. Guardio is a browser extension that acts as a first line of defense by providing real-time protection against emerging threats that you encounter while browsing the internet. This is very important because our web browser is where we do a lot of our online activity, and it stores some of our most sensitive information such as payment details, addresses, passwords, and more. So if all you have is antiviral, it's not keeping you safe and you need to secure your browser. I personally have worried about all the different social accounts I have to access on a day-to-day -day basis to publish our lab content, and I've wondered how vulnerable am I switching between these different accounts. But I know that I don't need to worry about this because I'm safe to browse and switch between these accounts because Guardio will detect the threats before they can cause harm. 
It does this by detecting phishing attacks in your email, detecting scam pop-ups, blocking crypto and rat scams, and will also block dangerous downloads, saving you from losing money. It will even alert you in real time on any device if your data has been compromised in an information leak. So if you want to join over 1 million other Guardio users that chose to keep safe online, go to guard.io slash IOHA and you can scan your browser for threats for free by installing the extension. This will also include a free 7-day trial to Guardio's premium features that covers four additional family members at no cost. And if that wasn't enough, Guardio is also offering our community 20% off. So get that first line of defense up and running. We'll also include this information and the link in the description below. So back to this discussion about potential lung adaptations. Now I've had a question about this in the past, or at least a question that related to this topic from students, and it was, could we possibly increase the total lung capacity? Which is a pretty valid and interesting question, because if we could cram more air into the body and into the lungs, we could get more oxygen to those exercising muscles. But there's two things we need to consider when it comes to this idea of increasing total lung capacity. One is even if we could increase the size of the lungs, your thoracic cavity is pretty much your thoracic cavity. And what I mean by that is you're not going to really increase the size of this cavity, which is going to limit how much the lungs could expand anyway. So it's not like you're going to exercise for like six months, 12 months, two years, and then take a tape measure around the lower part of, part of your rib cage and say, whoa, I increased my circumference of my thoracic cavity or my rib cage by three to four inches. Just not happening. There are certain conditions like COPD where we see changes in the chest wall, but that's a different story in a different video. But the second thing we need to consider when it comes to this idea of increasing total lung capacity is, do we even need to? And what I mean by that is, is the total lung capacity the bottleneck or the limiting factor when it comes to delivering oxygen during maximal exercise? And what we find the answer to that is no not even close. And to help us illustrate this point, let's go back to that example of a young, healthy male. If we were to measure the pulmonary ventilation, how much air he's moving in and out or utilizing during maximal exercise, we would see that those numbers average anywhere between 100 and 110 liters per minute. But when they measured the maximal breathing capacity, what the lungs are actually capable of doing, those numbers were as high as 150 to 170 liters per minute. That's crazy to think about because it means the maximal breathing capacity, what the lungs are actually capable of doing, is about 50% greater than what's being utilized during exercise or maximal exercise. So our lungs are overbuilt and there's a really good reason for this. It gives us this nice buffer or reserve for certain conditions. Say maybe you're exercising at a very high altitude or exercising in a very hot or unforgiving environment. It even gives this wiggle room or buffer for people with certain lung conditions. Now some of you might be thinking, wait a minute Jonathan, I've exercised at maximum capacity before and I was totally out of breath. I didn't feel like I could breathe anymore. My lungs have got to be a limiting factor, right? Well, as much as I can relate to that, let's kind of take a step back and think about the end game here. One of our main goals here is to get the oxygen being brought in from the lungs and get it delivered to the exercising skeletal muscles. And of course, get the carbon dioxide produced by those exercising skeletal muscles. But what gets the oxygen from the lungs to those exercising skeletal muscles? And that is this wonderful structure here, the heart, and as well as the other cardiovascular structures like the blood vessels. And so your heart is actually the major bottleneck in this situation. Because think of it this way, the lungs are bringing in all this air, you're working, they're doing their job and they're like, hey heart, we've got this air, this oxygen, take what you can, and if you need any more, we've got a nice reserve. And so one of the things that happens is the heart changes dramatically with exercise and even the skeletal muscles. And we have two separate videos on how the heart and how the muscles change with exercise, so I'll be brief with this. But one of the things that happens is the heart, the muscle within the heart gets stronger and with every beat, the heart can then pump more blood per beat. Not only that, blood volume will even increase. So if we have more blood, we have an increased oxygen carrying capacity. So think of it this way. As the cardiovascular system adapts, because we know the heart can really adapt well, is it will be able to utilize more of what the lungs are giving it, almost tapping more into that reserve. Also, the muscles, those working skeletal muscles, will also develop more capillaries within them, so they'll get more efficient at extracting or exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide. Again, 
utilizing more of what the lungs can give it or tapping more into that reserve. And some of you might be wondering, can we ever fully tap into that lung reserve or fully maximize what the lungs are capable of? Well, for us mere mortals, or those of us who are involved in generalized fitness, and even those who are the weekend warriors that maybe race in marathons, we'll never fully tap into what the lungs are capable of. There are only a small percentage of people who ever get to the point where the lungs could potentially be a bottleneck or a limiting factor. And those are the elite of the elite endurance athletes. And that's after all of these cardiovascular adaptations, all of these muscular adaptations that they develop from years and years of training. And in those situations, they'll still run into that situation or that problem with again having that volume or space issue with the thoracic cavity that the lungs occupy. Now, let's quickly address the elephant in the room here. You are watching a video on how the lungs could possibly change with exercise. And I'm standing here telling you that they don't change much at all. Well, hopefully you can gain some comfort or solace in the fact that we understand why that is and just seeing how cool it is that the lungs are built so well or overbuilt, if you will. However, that doesn't mean that we can't talk about two other adaptations briefly. One of those, we could make the argument, is an actual lung adaptation. They've shown this in the lab that with exercise, something called oxygen diffusing capacity can improve. Oxygen diffusing capacity is the rate at which oxygen moves from the alveoli into the pulmonary capillaries. And one of the reasons for this could be possibly a development of capillaries around those alveoli. Now remember capillaries are those tiny little blood vessels. Now some might argue developing more capillaries is just another cardiovascular adaptation. But if we were developing more capillaries around the alveoli, that would be within the lung tissue and would become part of the lung. So we are loosely counting that as a lung adaptation. The other adaptation I do want to mention is the muscles that get involved in breathing. The diaphragm, the accessory breathing muscles like the muscles found between the ribs called the intercostals. These muscles will get stronger with exercise. They're like other skeletal muscles. If you contract them more frequently and more forcefully, they'll get stronger. So you can be more effective with breathing in and out. And again, I'm sure you're going to be shocked to hear this. That will also tap into that reserve or more fully utilize what the lungs are capable of delivering to our wonderful bodies. Thanks for watching everyone. Hopefully you learned something new and amazing about what your lungs are capable of. If you're interested in increasing your browser security, go ahead and check out Guardio. That link is in the description below. Like and subscribe if you feel the need. Let us know what you thought in the comments. And of course, we'll see you in the next video.